you're listening to Send in the Experts with Georgina Durant. This podcast is all about teaching and supporting children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities at SEMD. My name is Georgina Durant. I'm the host of this podcast brought to you by Twinkle SEMD. As a former teacher in Senko myself, I wanted to create a platform to share some of the amazing things that my guests are doing to support learners with SEMD. So whether you're listening on your commute, tuning in whilst walking your dog or curled up on the sofa with a nice cup of coffee, thank you so much for joining us. In this episode, I'm really excited to be joined by Nana Marfe. Nana is a dis- disability advocate who speaks on the issues faced by disabled people within the labour market and in general society, from healthcare to social housing. Nana began his advocacy work in 2016 when he explains he experienced personal exclusion within his career as a public sector worker due to his race and disability. Unique Abilities Limited was formed to give disabled people a voice. Nana Marfo went on to do speaking events for Facebook, BBC, HMRC, and to be a freelance writer for the Independent Newspaper and the Metro, speaking again on disabled people and being seen and heard. Nana's fight for a voice and presence all stem from his own experiences as a disabled boy, now a man, living with a permanent tracheostomy tube that enables him to breathe and talk. Nana was born six months premature with a narrow airway and since birth has had to deal with weak respiratory condition, which affects him during winter periods with bad chest infections and now obviously with the impact of the COVID pandemic. In Nana's ideal world, he says he would want to see disabled people treated fairly, heard and seen within the wider community as he sees everyone, regardless of race, gender or disability, as capable of being successful and living a happy life. Wow, such an (laughs) inspirational bio there. It's so lovely to meet you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. Um, so let's start right at the beginning, if that's okay. I love to like hear the story behind things. Um, yep. Can you tell us your story? So you were born six months premature with a narrow airway. Was that was the yep. narrow airway due to being premature? And tell, tell me how it all started. Um, I think it it was because I was born when I was born. They realised I couldn't breathe properly. Gosh. So straight from birth, straight to surgery, wow. straight to in my neck well I don't know what that was called whether it's called a trachea but yeah um, something to stabilize me breathing um and because I was so tiny I was 26 weeks oh uh, I had to be in an incubator for at least about two and a half years oh my goodness that must have been really really tough for your family yeah especially my mom Gosh. like leave, leave and you know the baby ain't coming with you you've got to be there she spent most of her time in the hospital Uh, a couple of my aunties when when I grew up were like oh we had to drug her out she really didn't want to leave the side oh gosh it was a lot I can imagine I'm a mum myself and the thought of leaving my child at a hospital it just yeah it it does break your heart it sounds like it must have been really really difficult yeah, yeah. So can you explain, because I, I won't presume that everyone knows what a tracheostomy is. What actually, what is it and why do people have them? So a tracheostomy is basically a, t- a narrow tube within the trachea area. Mm-hmm. Um, and that enables you to see my, my little logo, you can see my trachea in my neck. Yeah. Um, and basically what it does is it enables a person who can't breathe effectively as yourself through your nose and through your normal lung way yeah. it enables us to have you know the flexibility of being able to um, breathe yeah but for some people it enables them to be able to talk and breathe um, and gives them the flexibility of doing that so in, in my instance because my airway and my trachea was very tiny oxygen getting to vital parts of my body was limited to a degree so they just wanted to give me the best possible option to be able to breathe yeah no that makes sense and when someone has a tracheostomy tube then do they is that something for life or do some people have it and then it goes and then I don't know very much about it okay some some people have it for a period of time Mm -hmm. and then their body gets you know their upper limb levels get stronger Mm -hmm. and they're able to live without it and then some are like myself who unfortunately the airways didn't grow with me. Yeah. I've got to have it permanently. But but I did have the experience of living without it. Did you? For five years. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They took it out. Um they wanted to see at the time I was about what, nine, eight, nine. They wanted to see if I could if the airway itself or the structure within my upper limb area would be strong yeah. enough as I'm growing. But 
for five years, it was perfect, and then in the fifth to sixth year, I'd say, what, 14, 15-ish age of age, the whole area decided to crumble on itself, oh, like, fold gosh. on itself, um, so I had limited oxygen going to my head, oh, uh, I was having headaches, severe headaches at night, and I just thought, okay, maybe I've overdone it, yeah. um, I was living with my dad at the time in Ghana, um, came back and they, I was told, yeah, your airways um re shrinking and it's folding on itself. Gosh. Oh my goodness. Yep. So uh in nineteen ninety seven my tracheostomy was uh reborn. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I bet that was tough for you as well. Like, you know, sort of like mentally to get have it to feel like it was as a kid, especially that sort of age, thinking, oh it's yeah. gone and now I can move on from that part of my life and then to have to have it back again must have been must have been tough. Yeah, you can imagine at that age, you know, getting getting to be wanting to be the cool kid, yeah. wanting to wanting to embrace my uh, my presence, get to know girls. <laughs> <laughs> that just went out. That just that just went out the window because oh. I had to, you know, I've been breathing through my nose for so long that now I'd had to readjust and learn how to breathe through a tube, and that was difficult in itself. Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I hadn't thought of that. And presumably, there's a lot of care that goes with having a tracheostomy as well, like keeping it clean from blockages and stuff like that. Do you have to do anything in particular to sort of keep it from from getting blocked or is what's the care so I, so as a child my mum used to change my tube sterilize the wound uh make sure that there's no you know secretions or anything yeah. that's preventing the wound from getting infected and I love my mum but I hated it when she done my tube it just <laughs> felt <laughs> it just felt like someone was stabbing oh gosh so Oh. Be, be, because be, because it was a delicate area, it's where the voice box is, yeah. and you know when, when someone's putting something in there, and it's not you because you know how to do it yourself because you know what everything is. Yeah. But when someone else is doing it, it just feels like oh, it's a bit rough. Yes. Yeah. So I kind of took it on board and learned how to do my tracking tube changes myself. Yeah. Uh, not everybody does. Some people still go into the hospital to get it done. Yeah. But. I for I need to be self sufficient. Yeah. Uh, I want to be able to do it for myself, so I learned how to do it, and I've been doing it ever since uh, I was uh, eighteen. Wow. So now. Yeah. yeah. And so, how often do you have to change it? Is it like a regular recurrence then? So at the moment, I've got a um, a chest infection which I've been battling for oh. a little while. So I have to change it very often. Yeah. Uh, I've got to change it tw- twice a week, yeah. uh, depending on what. That's my cat in the background. <laughs> we, honestly, this podcast, we, if someone doesn't have a dog or a cat, I don't think I'm doing a good episode. There is always something. <laughs> um, so based on that, uh, I, I change it more frequently. Yeah. But um, during my normal kind of, day to day I change it what once a week or once every two weeks yeah. and I'm fine just making sure you know my my morning routine is not as yourself who would just go to the bathroom brush their teeth wash their hair have a shower and off to work yeah. or whatever your day to day is my routine is wake up make sure the tube is 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 clear cough up any any gunk if there's anything so for being graphic guys no no don't uh, I think people need to hear it cough up any gunk um that's that's on my chest throughout the night uh i may use my nebulizer to kind of break down any harder secretions on my chest uh then i'd have to take out all my you know bob the builder tools to do my tracking (laughs) i'm imagining this like suitcase of tools that you have now (laughs) Yep. <laughs> so I t- take out all my all my trackier stuff, my sailor water, you know, everything that I need to sterilize wow. the wound. Uh, take out the tube, see how much secretions is in it. If it's a bit too much, then I'll chuck the tube, and you know, get a fresh pair of tubes. Use the uh, medical lube to kind of soften the the neck yeah. area, because obviously you can imagine as because. Even though it's a hole in my neck, you know when you cut yourself, yeah. 
your, your your skin automatically wants to heal itself. Yes. So that's the same approach oh, with wow. my home. If I if I take out a tube and I leave it out for more than let's give it say twenty minutes, no, automatically right. it will try and merge itself oh, wow. to heal. You're like, no, stop. <laughs> Don't heal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One one night one night I had a bad cough to the point where I coughed out and my tube forces forced itself out. Oh my goodness. So I was unaware because I was asleep. When I woke up, I was like, oh, that's odd. I'm not feeling my tube. That's a bit odd. Yeah. And then, and then I saw my tube on the floor. Oh, I was like, oh, crap. Yeah. So I had no choice. Again, sorry for the graphics, guys. No, no, I had no choice it. but to put lube on, 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 on a fresh tube and force it in. And the amount of blood oh, that, gosh. yeah, it, it was not fun. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of it's, work for that. It's, 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 yeah, it's a technical job, but someone's got to do it. <laughs> Sounds like you're practically trained as a doctor now <laughs> through doing it yourself. Gosh, and your mum yeah. must have been tough for your mum having to do that. Obviously, she would because parents do, and you you know, you love your children, and you've got to do it, but it must be tough because yeah. the neck area is so delicate. And it, you know, what I mean, it must yeah. have been hard the first few times she was doing it. It must be a worry. Yeah, I could tell she was squeamish. I could tell because it's just doing this. Oh, oh you can oh, oh, have I hurt you? Oh, oh bless. <laughs> <laughs> and as mums wind, wind kids up as well, don't we? I imagine it was an annoyance yeah. as you're growing up. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> in terms of, in, we've sort of touched on it a little bit, in terms of impacts on speech, did it affect your, like when you learned to talk, did you talk later on um, than sort of normal? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or did, uh, did it not impact your speech? It, in the beginning stages, when I first had it, when I was growing up as a kid, yeah. yes, it impacted my voice. My voice was a bit more shallow right. than it is. I'm, I'm not saying my voice has really projected any higher, yeah. but um, it was very shallow. So I had a lot of speech therapy oh, in and out of yeah, in and out of speech therapy for about can I say a year, eight to 18, 18 months plus. Um, just going in and out, making sure you know my voice voice uh, chords weren't affected. Yeah. Uh, I was having some type of voice voice training yeah. to make sure there was some kind of uh, vibration coming from the voice box. Um, and I think when it got reborn in 97, I had to go through the whole drama again um. of going through speech therapy and making sure my voice box, because apparently when they went down, my voice box was, because everything was, you know, kind of squashed together. Yeah. My voice box was so close that when they done the surgery, they were scared that they'd actually oh, no. cut my voice box. Oh gosh! Yeah. But thankfully, they hadn't, which is a relief. Hey, <laughs> I'm here now, Miss the Unique Voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, so your experience of speech therapy when you were a kid, was, how was that? Did you? Because it's it's really interesting to hear people's actual, you know, lived experience of of speech therapy because we talk about it a lot in from the perspective of a speech therapist. But what's it like yeah. as a child going through speech therapy? And, and importantly, what was the difference? Because I imagine when you were when you had to start the speech therapy again when you were older, was that tougher than just doing it when you were a kid and it just felt like what you normally did? Right. So as a kid, I loved doing it. Did you? It, 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 it just felt like 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 an appointment. Yeah. The doctor the doctor puts a little camera down there, checks a few things out, tell, tells me to do that, uh, tells me to do something. <laughs> oh no, <none of, laughs> oh no, here's a sweet. Like, <laughs> Sounds ace. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's cool. <laughs> but then as I got older, I think it became a lot more harder yeah. mentally on me. Yeah. Um I didn't like the fact that I had to put something on my tongue and my tongue had to be out for a little while, they had to check things, yeah. I had to say things. And by then that that loll- lollipop bribery, <laughs> yeah. Like, just get age, one from the shop. Why why do I need to do all yeah. of this for one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, at the shop, I was, I was, I was at that age, I was like, nah, I don't, nah. Don't. <laughs> it's not good enough. And I bet you felt different yeah, yeah. as well, didn't you, from your peers? Like if they're doing football after school and you're having to do speech therapy, that must have felt... felt yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, I, there's times when I missed, a, I missed a lot of school, actually. Did you? Because I was, I was in and out, yeah. you know. Um, and, 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 and we haven't even got to the educational bit. No, but, no. Um, um, yeah, it, it was an impact. I did feel, I felt different. Yeah. I, I wasn't quite aware I had a disability. 
I knew there was something different about me yeah. and yeah yeah no it sounds so. and, and medically then I know you've said about you've got a chest infection at the moment um yeah presumably you're going to be a lot more um vulnerable to sort of respiratory diseases and and that side of things yeah. um and I yeah. bet the COVID pandemic's been particularly hard for you yeah funny enough I got the COVID in July 2021 yeah um and the way the doctors were panicking around me when I went in I had the VIP treatment of my life. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not normally one to like to be fussed over, but I was fussed over. I, I, I actually felt I was part of the Royals. Cause, <laughs> yeah, I, I had my own room. They kept on checking on me yeah. every, every, I would even say four minutes. Yeah, four minutes. Wow. Yeah, because they were so concerned that, because of my vulnerability they thought right you know covid could cripple him or covid could you know kill him so you know it was very uh touch and touch and go during that period but i'm here i'm here to tell the tale were you shielding for most of the pandemic then uh yes i was but i decided to be um he-man for those who don't know he-man it was a great cartoon cartoon character in my time (laughs) Uh, I decided to be he man and uh, I got a job in a charity uh, working in a send school working with send send um, young people and one of the students blessed them they they, they felt very bad after that I said no need it happens Uh, I got infected infected by COVID uh, by going into the school and yeah 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 gosh yeah that's brilliant that you're working in a send school as well though about you're a real inspiration to them and nice to, for them to see. oh yeah 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 oh that's brilliant so talking about school then in general you, what what was school like for you did you presume did you go to mainstream primary school or did you go to okay. a, a special school what, what happened this is all it around this way around <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is the good bit <laughs> this is the good yeah, story yeah. we need to hear yeah right so when I was born and you know after the two-year period I managed to I went to a normal nursery, apparently, my mum was saying. Um, yeah. You know, I, I got into a nursery. I like that, apparently, as if your mum... Yeah. You don't know, but you yeah. presume your mum's telling the truth. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, when it came to me getting into primary school, this is where it became uh, political and very tactical and very um, uh, medical model kind of structured. Yeah. Um, so it was more of he has a disability we need to send him to a sense school yeah. and that's where he belongs and it wasn't Gosh. about right he's got a disability yes but his mental faculties are not screwed up so we can basically put him in a mainstream school and see how he fares yeah. if it doesn't work out then maybe we can revert him to a sense school yeah. so all this procedure was going on for about two and a half years. I wasn't in school. Wow. Uh, my mum was going through tribunals and eventually my mum got frustrated and said, look, we can fight our battles as parent and local authority. But as far as I'm concerned, my son's not going to lose out on education. Yeah. So you guys have to fund some type of funding somewhere yes. to educate him at home. Yeah. Yeah, so that he catches up with his peers by the time he by the time you get him into a mainstream school or a send school, wherever you want to take yeah. him. Yeah, your mum sounds, by the way, like a an inspirational woman. She sounds wonderful. Yep, yep. Um, so that happened. Uh, I had a tutor coming to me three days a week at the time, mm-hmm. um, and then I was, you know, given homework, so it was treated like. You know, uh, I was doing homeschooling before homeschooling became You were ahead of your times. Little did you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 20 years down the yeah. line or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, that was happening for a long period of time. And I think, that again, then again, my mum was like, listen, he needs to mix with different people. We can't yeah. just keep him home. He can't, he can't just be seeing mum and dad and that's it um you know he needs to develop develop his uh social yeah. skills um so they were like right okay well we've decided uh he's gonna go to a sense school my mum was like uh i don't think that's a good idea because 
he's very hyperactive and no 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 disrespect to the people that go to the send school i don't think my son's in the right place yeah. and they were like no 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 mr Muff, this is marvel he's got a disability and he needs to be in the send school my mom was like all right i'm gonna give you to him and you're gonna come back and tell me you made the wrong choice <laughs> <laughs> so i went to the send school for about two weeks oh wow and then your mum was right <laughs> in my third week apparently I was the most aggressive oh, child gosh. that they'd come across and all the children there had severe cerebral palsy and severe learning disabilities yeah. and I was a child where it it's like I'd eaten sugar for a month <laughs> So I was bouncing off the walls and apparently, I don't remember doing this as a child, but apparently there was one kid I was infatuated with and I grabbed him from his wheelchair, put him on the floor okay. and I was dr- dragging him. So they were like, right, right, nope, okay, Mrs. Marfa, you're right, <laughs> he's not meant to be here, we'll put him in the mainstream school and we will try and see if we can get, um, at the time it was called a statement. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? in place yeah. to you know manage his needs um so it took about a month or two months for me to for, for for a school to actually take me on um there's a school in east london uh called cyborn lovely school my first ever school that gave me a chance Brilliant. um and i was there till till year six uh, it was it was a great experience. Mm-hmm. I think at the time I still didn't know I was disabled. Every winter, because we used to have bad winters in the in the nineties. We did indeed. I remember it well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I was told um, I couldn't play out with my friends, so I'd have to come inside into the warmth. Yeah. And watch my friends run around and. You know, oh, there's not the sn- snotty noses, playing, playing tag, and I was just sitting down, just watching them through the window. Oh. So one day, I just, one day my teacher came to get me outside, and I kicked her because <laughs> I thought, You're frustrated. I thought, yeah. yeah, I thought, why do I keep, why am I being taken in? And apparently, when they called my parents in, they were like, oh we told them to do this because it's to keep you safe in terms of your barrier. Yeah. Um, at the time, I still didn't know what they were on about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they were like, right, you've, you've got a breathing condition. They didn't even call it a disability. They said, oh, you've got a breathing condition and you've got a tube in your neck. And, you know, that's why yeah. we've asked the teachers to put you indoors during the winter. Summertime, you're fine. Wintertime, you can't because it will affect your airways. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Thanks for telling me. That's just, I think that it would have helped if I knew. <laughs> <laughs> no idea why you're inside and the others were out. That's so, that must have yeah. been really tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my learning needs, uh, I think in the beginning I was a bit, a bit slow at catching up with stuff mm-hmm. in terms of my maths, my English and even paying attention yeah. in, in class. I was, a bit, I was a bit of a disruptive one. Um, so again, my support worker did help. Yeah. I had a lot of one-to-one sessions and they would come into the class and sit beside me whilst, mm. um, whilst the lessons were going on and they would take notes for me and mm. you know assist me that way. So I had that up until primary school then my dad had this miraculous idea that right you're growing your airways is going to grow with you let's go to africa so at the age of 10 my tube got taken out i went to live with my dad in ghana for five years and that was a lovely you, you would have thought that was the nice honeymoon to a traumatic time yeah. <laughs> but um as i said before previously everything at the age of 14 everything just yeah. downplayed itself um but even when i was out there my breathing you could tell my breathing was different yeah because i was like I- i'm adjusting to not having a tracky yeah, yeah. learning how to breathe through the nose and even you know at the time people out there 
you know, to bless them, you know, ignorance. Um, they were like, oh, you've got asthma, you know, just take your time, sit down, you know, you don't need to do much, you know, don't, 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 don't overexert yourself, you know, you don't, you really, really, really just take a seat, you know. So I was hearing all these kind of, you know, flyby comments. Yeah. Um, and at the time, back home, disability wasn't really a thing, or it wasn't really something that people in Ghana actually knew about you know yeah. no no not 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 downplaying that you know they could have known better about that time yeah. I think I think everywhere disability wasn't really a thing no, I don't think it was I think you're right you know um so coming back fast forward uh going to have the tracking back put back in and then the fire happened again with education oh my gosh yep finally managed to get into a secondary school um it was said sedge hill in catford yay <laughs> i love this it's like shout out <laughs> shout outs to this school <laughs> little wave they, yep they opened their doors to okay. me because one of my friends who we 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 shared we shared a ward in a great woman street she was already at the school oh cool so it was a very easy transition okay. because she had a track aid. Did she? Wow, so it, that must have been yeah. a huge help for you. Wow, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She had a track aid. She was already in there. So they knew what they were getting yeah, there. They, they knew what they were getting themselves into. Yeah, all the groundwork presumably had been done and the training. And yeah, yeah. Oh, that must have been yeah. a real relief for you and your family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think my mum was excited too to know she's there, so I'm not alone. Absolutely, and, you know. yeah, because you, your mum must have had to do a lot of, like, trailblazing, being the first ones, like, at the primary school, telling them what to do and all yeah. of that. It's, it must have been exhausting for her. So, yeah, I imagine yeah. then there was a bit of a sigh of relief that someone had done a bit of the work for her and she didn't need to do it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, my secondary school years was good. good. Um can't really complain about that yeah Yeah, and so were your friends like at primary school and at secondary how inclusive were they were they kind to you uh kids will be kids um i think they were pre-warned before i got to the school because the only reason why i know that is because one of them wanted to be a bully or do something and they were like oh we can't do nothing to you because we were all sat down in 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 a (laughs) assembly and told you were coming and we can't do nothing to you. We have to treat you different. And I was like, oh, oh. okay. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice to know. <laughs> yeah. It's a strange one, really, isn't it? Like, you do, obviously, it's pleased that you do, you're going to be exempt from bullying, from the bully. But, um, yeah, yeah, the idea of an assembly about you must have been a bit like, oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 When they said that, I was like, wow. Okay. I was, I was never told this, but wow. All right. Yeah. And so, so what advice would you, because there'll be teachers listening, some probably with children with a tracheostomy tube at the moment. Yeah. What advice would you give to teachers to make sure that the children they teach who are disabled or have a long-term medical condition are able to like learn and enjoy school? What advice would you give them? I think the advice I'd give them is, is to be empathetic, yeah. is to be very uh, understanding. Um, you know, children, while well, I was once a child, children like, like myself uh, and from what I've experienced working as a youth worker with said children is we're very, uh, our minds are very wide and diverse and we, we think of a lot of things at once and you may think we're, 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 we're having a tantrum, but we're not. Our minds is just racing 165 miles per hour. So it's all about just grasping what you can from the young person, you know, coming to the level of that young person yeah. and really understanding what, it is they're trying to say or trying to do and treat them as as individuals and their disability secondary you know never be like oh what's wrong oh you're okay oh oh, you're right Uh, no don't smother yeah it's patronizing (laughs) yeah we we we, we get enough of that from society and enough of that from extended family or the home and the last thing we want to do when we come to a place where we feel kind of liberated yeah. is a school where a teacher is making you feel you know like you're a statistic and it's a medical model approach yeah. uh, I don't I don't really want that I want the social m- model I want to be included I want to be spoken to as yes I'm Nana and I'm not Nana living with a trackie yeah. 
and you know just just include me in everything and anything yeah. and if I if I choose not to participate I've taken that bold decision myself not to participate yeah not not the teacher for taking it for you yeah I think that's yeah. really really important is there any did you have any teachers in particular that sort of stick in your head that we'd have to name them and give them a shout out but you can <laughs> but did, were there any that sort of their approach stuck in your head that was really good or 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 likewise not so good yeah um I had, I had my English teacher, Miss mm-hmm. Carr. Yay! <laughs> <I'm a star. laughs> yeah, yeah. She, um, she, she, she was brilliant. Yeah. She, she made me feel included. She did not um, exclude me or treat me any different Good. from the class. Um, even though my my literacy skills were not as great as some people, she made me feel I could do it regardless. Um, um, she really took time out you know when the when majority of the class was gone she take time out to look at stuff for me go over stuff yeah. give me pointers so she had time yeah. she had time and empathy and understanding and she never looked at me as a person with a disability she yeah. just looked at me as a regular regular student brilliant which is exactly what um, you needed oh yeah. yeah um and i think my 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 negative years is my primary school years when teachers didn't really understand disability yeah. um so i think at that moment in time, it was quite difficult to be an individual. It was more about, mm-hmm. we need to usher him to a room. He needs to be monitored. He needs to be taken care of. And yeah, yeah. I didn't have quite a good time uh, educational-wise in mm-hmm. primary school. Do you, do you think education for disabled children has improved from the 90s? You know, I was a kid of the 90s as well, like going to school in the 90s. And I, I think it, there's been a lot of changes. Um, but from your perspective, do you think things have improved? Um, sad to say, yes, we've got a lot more legislations in place. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're a bit more commercial than we were back in the 90s, but that's where it stops. Really? I think, yeah, because there's a, I got an email from a mother uh, who lives in Yorkshire Mm -hmm. and her son, it was like I was reading my own story. Oh, gosh. And this was in 2012. Wow. It was like I was reading my own story. Yeah. He, he'd, he'd, he'd been taken out of school. He wasn't in a mainstream school. He wasn't in education because they were fighting on where he should go. Um, funding was being cut for him. Uh, yeah, it was just ridiculous. And I thought, wow. At the time, I was, what, 35? And I'm like, rough, 35 years later, and it's still Gosh, that's the really same thing's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, you would like to think that thing, the same history wouldn't be repeating itself, wouldn't you? You would like to think we've moved on yeah. from that. That's really heartbreaking yeah. to hear. Yeah. yeah, it's not good enough, is it? <laughs> no. So when you finished, when you finished school, what do you, what did you do then? What what happened after school? So your experiences uh, so in the uh, workplace. So after school, I I hated going to get pocket money of my mum. That's for sure. <laughs> Because I had to go through the rigma of what you're using the money for, <laughs> what you're going to buy, how much do you need? I was like, oh, I don't want this. I just want to, you know, go to the wall, type in a pin, and take out my money. Yeah, that ATM machine doesn't really need to know what you're getting it out for, does it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to explain yourself to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, my first, I, I, went, I went round, handed out CVs those days. Those days, there wasn't no such thing as the internet. You had to go to Oxford Street, hand out your CVs. Uh, and even before that, I when I when I started college, um, I got my first job in McDonald's. So that was my first job, um, and that's all because I went in there and said, oh, "Have you got Have you got any vacancies?" And they're like, "Yep." So Brilliant. I handed them my CV, and that was my first ever job. Um, it was it was it was interesting to know what people do to earn money. Yeah, Because yeah. when I because when I was a kid, I was like, yeah, mum, buy me Sega Mega Drive, buy me this, buy me that. And then <laughs> when it came to the realization of, oh, you've actually got to work hard, for money, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was my first job. Then I realized, okay, I'm not made for the kitchen. I thought, nah, cooking ain't my thing. Um. I ended up getting a job at Phones for You, you know. Yeah, I remember the adverts. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> um, I worked there for about three years. Learn, I learned a lot from you know the John Clover group. I learned a lot from yeah. them. Uh, I learned my social skills. I learned how to talk to people. I learned how to be a salesman. It gave me a bit more confidence in going out in society and um, you know just talking to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that that crucial skill they gave me enables me now to i mean i mean look how i communicated with you yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not scared to you know network and just talk to people yeah. so yeah i thank i thank i thank that role for doing that yeah i remember the phones <laughs> phones for you going in the shop and they were always very it must have been the training but they were always right there in front of you you know you couldn't just go in and have a look at the nice new phones and dream it was like it was a salesman yeah. there and they were they were ready yeah. to sell you a phone so i imagine that training of like having the confidence yeah. to go up to people straight away as they came through the door and say yeah. what do you need and train yeah must yeah, yeah good training <laughs> yeah well well i think in my in my defense you know doing that and knowing that i look different and i have a track yeah record, yeah it, it it was another level for Absolutely. me i didn't know how my colleagues took it but for me it was a major step for me. Yeah, no, I can imagine. It really would be. Um, so you've had to fight for your employment rights. It always hasn't been as smooth for you, has it, in the workplace? Yeah. And we know that yeah. employers need to make changes, but is there anything um, that teachers, because there'll be teachers listening and are thinking about how they can prepare older learners, older kids and teenagers, how they can prepare them for the world of work so that they know their rights? Because I think there isn't enough done to help children with that stage because you go from being a teenager in college or in school or whatever and then you go into the employment world and if you're disabled and then um there's some extra barriers in place how how can we help teachers know how to tell these kids about their rights and, and what they need to be doing i think there should be lesson, le- lessons lessons yeah. in the curric- curriculum especially within the sense setting mm. um you know telling them you know being brutally honest with children yeah. with disabilities that Yes, you are going to have obstacles. It's not going to be plain sailing. It's not just going to be about your your um, your qualifications, as it is for some people. Mm-hmm. It's going to be about your qualifications. It's going to be about your your health barrier. It's going to be about how you integrate in that workplace, and it's going to be about um, ha- what your productivity is going to be like within that workplace. Yeah. You know, because you're coming along with all these different kind of baggages and. Mm-hmm at the bottom line of it the employer cares about how you're going to be productive yeah so it's about an employer taking a personal centered approach it's about teachers you know not hiding or diluting how they present themselves to the young person or enabling the young person to project themselves you know yeah not not sugarcoating it just being honest with them real gosh that's that must be a difficult thing to say to kids though and like to have that truth being told i suppose they're going to find that unfortunately going to find that truth out sooner or later and it might be easier perhaps yeah. from from people that yeah. care about them but gosh yeah yeah you know it's 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 difficult I mean from my experience working at the said school I had an individual who I assisted get into a intern no not internship it's uh Apprentice. like a project 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 search okay. kind of um program yeah and um, they didn't want to, you know, they, they were skeptical about being a nurse and, you know, they didn't want to say, talk about their disability and, you know, they, they knew that an employer wouldn't be accepting or, you know, all these were preconceived yeah. ideas of what they'd seen adults older than them possibly go through in their lives. Um, so dealing with that individual i made them aware that you know it's good to be upfront and to the point with people you yeah. know it may be difficult but it's part of your life it's part of your story and it makes it it makes you who you are yeah so it's best the employer knows who you are from the cuff rather than halfway through you're like oh i've got this wrong i've got that wrong employers are not candid yeah. or don't take they, they they tend to put us in a box when we say where we've got stuff wrong with us, oh, he's trying to Skype or she's trying to Skype off work yeah. or he's trying to manipulate the system. There's nothing wrong with him. But employees need to understand you're not you're not us. You're not in yeah. our bodies. You don't understand how we feel. I, you know, I could go to sleep perfectly all right today and then tomorrow I could wake up and I've got a bad chest infection, yeah. which, you know, I deal with most of the most of my life. Yeah um 
So it's about giving the umph to the young person to say, you know what? Talk with your chest held high. You know, obviously in a professional manner, because I know as children we can go through a tantrum and we may say certain stuff that is not very, uh, you know, professional. Mm -hmm. So it's about finding a professional way of being your honest and authentic self yeah. and expressing how your disability makes you feel on a day to day, how you feel if they adapt the role to suit your personal centered approach, yeah. how you can be productive yeah. within your framework not what they want but what mm. you can do for them yes. and then they can meet you halfway and adapt the role to suit you that's brilliant a really really good way of explaining it and so your non-profit organization is unique abilities can you tell us what the aim of that is and what inspired you to launch it so unique as everyone's different yeah when you look at my logo, it's got different shapes and sizes. So, you know, disability comes in all forms, all genders, all different, you know, fluids and you name it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> unique abilities is we've all got a talent. We're all living life, right? Yeah. We're all born, we all go to school, we all be, you know, college, whatever. We all have a path in life and, you know, it's kind of uniform. The only difference is those of us with a disability, we're on that same journey with you, but we're taking a different uh, ways or Google Maps approach <laughs> to get into that destination of where we need yeah. to be. So, so a unique journey to the same destination. Yeah. And it's basically giving people <clears throat> the voice and understanding that, yes, you can talk. Yes, you're unique. Embrace your uniqueness. There's obstacles out there that are going to prevent you. A lot of red tape out there, but you can have the platform to have your voice heard. You can have the platform to be able to express yourself freely without judgment, without uh, being put in a pigeon box, without feeling that if you talk about your indifference, you're going to be smirked, that laughed, that judged, um, you know, made to feel little, you know, made to feel inferior. No, unique abilities is about expressing yourself freely opening up to the world of who you are and just knowing your rights yeah. i think I, i'm really keen on people knowing their employment rights yeah. because when you look at the the employment rate of disabled people to able-bodied people is 53.6 percent and you've got 80 percent to 90 percent of able-bodied wow. people going into work so yeah. the scales is a bit yeah, it's not right. unbalanced yeah, yeah. need sorting and you're the man to sort it it seems <laughs> And you're clearly, you're clearly an inspiration to many people. And I imagine lots of young people as well would be really inspired by your journey and what you're doing. Who inspires you, can I ask? Is there somebody that's... Because often when we're people who are inspirational themselves, they've had somebody that's made them that way. Do you know what I mean? Is there anyone, is there anyone that's got your back who's your inspiration? My mom. I knew you were going to say your mum. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, my mum. Um, because... You know, I'll just share a little bit of her story. For a woman that came from Africa who, unfortunately, because her parents didn't have the means and the ways to take her, to put her into school. Yeah. And for her to come here, you know, and the 80s was a different world. England was different in the 80s. Yeah. So for her to come here to a big, wide world where most of the time the weather was dull and grey and cold and... <laughs> you name it, and to come and fight for her first child with a disability yeah. and, you know, go to tribunals and her English wasn't perfect and to be able to stand up to judges and, you know, stand up to departments that were trying to, can I use the word deface? No, that's not really a, a term. Uh, trying to, you're marginalizing yeah. to a to, to discriminate. Degree discriminate um and for her to stick up for me all those years and you know when i grew up and i was self-aware i was thinking oh this woman is bonkers <laughs> everywhere we go everywhere we go she's fighting why is she fighting i just want to go quietly <laughs> but then when i grew up and i had to face the tribulations myself i understood perfectly why she yeah. was going on like a bouncing kangaroo <laughs> I understood everything then and I was like right okay cool I understand now and yeah. 
yeah, I, I thank her for being my mum. Oh, she sounds an absolutely amazing woman. She really does. And it it's so frustrating that people have to, well, still do have to fight for the rights of people with disabilities and special educational needs. It's very yeah. disappointing and frustrating. Um, so yeah. what are your hopes for the future for, like, disabled people? Do you think... What, what do you hope in, I don't know, well, hopefully now, but like in a few years time, if there was a child with a tracheostomy in school, what, what are you hoping for them in the future? How do you want it to be I different? Think what I'm, I think what I'm hoping for is that a tracheostomy is seen as, as a barrier. Yes, give all the support you can. Uh, um, don't pigeonhole a person with a disability yeah. uh, with a tracheostomy. Uh, don't assume because they've got a track to me their voices can't be heard and can't and they can't be seen. Yeah. Uh, don't have a conversation and not involve them in that conversation. I've noticed that over the years le- legislations have changed and allowed to ask the person what they want yeah. rather than yeah. what they want to provide for them. Mm-hmm. So that's 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 a bonus. In my years, I was just put in a room with people and people talking to my mom and oh, I felt gosh. I, I felt why, why am I here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just listening to all the things about you but not being able to voice yeah. your opinion. Gosh. Yeah. So I think it's more of just just understanding and you know, especially as a business, if you're going to take someone on with a river track used to me just know that life isn't going to be plain sailing not a lot of the tasks or the job um spec uh demands that person will be able to do they, they may they may be able to do what 75 percent of the role does that make them incompetent no because no. I've, I've come across employers who may deem someone with a disability because they can't do 25 percent of a role they start to call them incompetent and they oh, start God. to you know, use it against them in their in their annual appraisal, and oh, sorry, yeah. you couldn't get this this year's appraisal because you've been ill or <laughs> it's due to your sickness, and <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's not honest. So I think, so I think what I would tell teachers is one, make allowances for people with disabilities. I'm not saying treat them overly different. Yeah. Yes. They have to understand that there's consequences in life and there's mm. stages in life that you go through that are a bit crap. But at the same time, work with that individual. You know, if they're ill and they can't come in, let them work from home, give them homework at home, yeah. let them do stuff at home. If you've got an assembly going on, mm. now we've got the magical teams, we've got the magical Zoom. Yeah. Involve them in the in the assembly that way. Yeah, that's know, such um, a good idea. Yeah. And sort of yeah, not just because we've had this technology and it's worked, it'd be such a shame if we stopped using it. Cause I imagine yeah. it's been a lot more accessible in some ways for some children who are yeah. just you know, who have disabilities. So yeah, yeah, utilizing yeah. that and involving children that are having to be at home for periods of time would have been really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, looking at those avenues and, you know, just making the child feel included and not excluded. Yeah. And, you know, same applies to college. College, university, the support kind of drifts off. Okay. And I think university and college institutions need to really not let it drift off. Mm-hmm. It can be a softer approach and guided by the individual because they're adults at the yes. time. Um, but that support, that same yellow sub kind of support from from primary school to secondary school it needs to continue mm-hmm. up until that individual says you know what i'm sick of you guys now i can i can i can, I can walk around or <laughs> i can do what i need to do myself yes um so that i noticed that crack right or that kind of yeah dislocation when i got to college yeah everything just stopped gosh yeah, that's you know, it's until I, I started to tell the college that I've got this wrong, you know, I need support here. And then when I got to uni, it just, it's like I was talking Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, they were like, disability, what are you on about? Like, I've got disability. I'm a student. I need support. I need somewhere to live. I need reasonable adjustments. And it was all new things to them at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think slowly, but surely they're doing it. Uh, I went and done a speech at Reading University a couple of years ago and I can see they've got like a little committee uh, happening and it's slowly but surely happening. So I think just teachers from all spectrums of education just need to be aware that that change, yeah. just because I'm growing as an adult, my disability doesn't fade away yeah. and it doesn't poof, yeah. disappear. Yeah. You know, I can't, I'm not expected to call... Um, um, inspector gadget and get it all out and I'm normal <laughs> no 
my disability stays if anything it gets worse over the years that I'm growing mm-hmm. so just make sure that that support system is fluid and it's kind of drifting off according to the individual yeah not according to the stage that they're at yeah absolutely yeah. that's really really yeah. important so can you direct us to your website because I'm sure lots of people will be really intrigued to find out more about what you do so can you tell us where your website is your social media how people can find out about the wonderful work you're doing okay so I'm, I'm in the process of building a website so that's 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 coming uh, my handle for twitter is at mr underscore unique voice no, und- mr underscore unique underscore voice yeah. and then it's the same handle for instagram linkedin uh there's so many uh, <laughs> so many are you on yeah, tiktok yeah. <laughs> have you branched yes, are I you am. you branched out onto tiktok yes. cool yes 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 i'm on tiktok same handle yeah awesome well i'll make sure the links are in sort of underneath the podcast so people can have a click on those and, and find you on there Thank you so much for joining us. You've been an absolute brilliant guest. Really, really interesting. I really enjoyed recording that episode with Nana Marfo. Do make sure you check out the links that I'll be sharing to his social media, as well as some resources from Twinkle that are relevant to this episode. So have a look if you're teaching children with medical needs in particular, these might be really useful. So do check out the resources shared on there. Thanks again for listening to Send In The Experts with me, Georgina Durant. Catch you next time.